There were ten of us. Two sisters died young, soon after they'd been born. So there were eight of us. It was hard, very hard. The soil is very poor around here. Father was a carpenter, so that helped a bit. The 13 rugged acres owned by Faustina's father barely kept the Kowalska family alive. Faustina's brother, Mieczysław, says his sister never complained. Instead, he remembers her as someone always trying to love God in simple ways. She was a really good girl. Sometimes we'd graze the cattle and she'd decorate wayside shrines. She wouldn't go with the other girls. And she kept telling our parents that one day she'd go on a pilgrimage. What no one knew was that the pilgrimage Faustina spoke of was a spiritual one. And in reality, it had already begun. Her spiritual journey started at an early age inside St. Kashmir's parish church where Faustina was baptized as an infant. It was also here at age seven she heard for the first time an interior voice within her soul calling her to love more perfectly. As a very young girl having received First Communion on her way back home, she was asked by a neighbor, why are you walking alone and not with the other girls? And she replied, I'm not walking alone, I'm walking with the Lord Jesus. And throughout her life to the end, she nurtured the awareness of God's presence in her soul. By the time Faustina turned 16, she began expressing an ardent desire for religious life. This distressed her parents because her absence would mean less help and the loss of family income. They subsequently discouraged the idea, and Faustina stayed in Gugowitz. But three years later, in July of 1924, weeks before her 20th birthday, a pivotal event in Faustina's life occurred near this tree. It catapulted her into a remarkable series of spiritual experiences that would alter the course of her short life forever. One day on a Sunday, she went with her sister and their friends to a dance in a Wuj park. And there, while she was dancing, Jesus, very much in pain, appeared to her. And he said, how long are you going to lead me astray? How long am I going to suffer because of you? She left the dance right away and went to the Wuj Cathedral. And there, lying prostrate on the floor, asked Jesus to give her an answer to tell her what she was to do next. Jesus told her to go to Warsaw right away. You'll enter a convent there. Assured of what she must do, Faustina left for Warsaw at once. There she was rejected at every convent door except one. The Congregation of the Sisters of Our Lady of Mercy, a religious order dedicated to helping prostitutes reform their lives. After Faustina entered the Sisters of Mercy, her superior, in her notes, assess the new novice as no one special and put Faustina to work to pay for her religious clothing. She was a simple, uneducated nun with just three grades of elementary schooling. She rarely left the convent and performed the most mundane tasks. Her life appeared so ordinary on the outside. She was busy working and spent part of her time in the chapel. Every day she met the same people. Her day had the same rhythm. So on the outside, she led a dull, humdrum existence. Beneath her perceived dull existence, Faustina's deep inner life overflowed with extraordinary mystical graces, divine revelations, and heavenly visitations. Christ began appearing frequently to her in visions, sometimes as the King of Mercy, resplendent in light and majesty. At other times, he appeared as the tortured, crucified Christ. At the request of her spiritual director, Faustina began privately to record these mystical experiences in a diary. She didn't have a newspaper, she didn't have the radio to reach people, and she didn't travel. All she had were her little notebooks and a pen. She had neither an office nor a secretary. 
She herself was a secretary of divine mercy. She just quietly kept on writing in her journals in those little notebooks of hers. She'd describe her conversations with Jesus. It was to this novice, considered no one special by her superior, that Jesus Christ would quietly entrust a great mission. Christ instructed Faustina to remind the world about God's unfathomable mercy. She was to accomplish this by introducing new devotional practices to honor mercy and by establishing a worldwide movement of souls dedicated to spreading divine mercy. Jesus directed Faustina to proclaim to the world that even the worst and most hopeless sinner was deserving of God's infinite mercy. It is divine mercy, he said, that will determine the future destiny of the world. Speak to the world about my mercy. Let all mankind recognize my unfathomable mercy. It is a sign for the end times, after it will come the day of justice. While there is still time, let them have recourse to the fount of my mercy. Because Christ desired this urgent message of mercy for the entire world, Faustina's mission would have far-reaching implications, but it would also meet with much opposition. Accepting it would often come at a high price. Faustina was to endure a silent, tedious day-to-day -day martyrdom. Most of her life inside the convent was spent in poor health because of tuberculosis and she was ridiculed by her convent sisters who labeled her as lazy or eccentric. On a spiritual level, Faustina's suffering was even more intense. She sometimes struggled against feelings of doubt and despair, but she prevailed over these emotions with the conviction that her sufferings were redemptive and had great meaning, thus displaying heroic faith in God. But Christ continued to remind Faustina that even the strongest faith is of no avail without works. And because of this, he wanted people to practice mercy daily through deed, word, and prayer. Souls could accomplish this by means of the new devotions Christ entrusted to Faustina. Jesus even told Faustina he wanted those who believed in him to perform at least one act of mercy a day. Not just any good deed, but one especially for the love of him. Not just any good acts or philanthropy motivated by something else. The condition is that at least one good act a day, in word or deed or prayer, should be done for the love of Jesus. Faustina herself was presented with many such opportunities to practice mercy. One difficult example came during a family visit to her parents' home in February 1935, when she was asked by a family friend to pick up a dirty and diseased child. One of these friends came with a child whose eyes were diseased and filled with pus, and she said to me, Sister, take it in your arms for a moment, please. My nature recoiled, but not paying attention to anything, I took the child and kissed it twice, right on the infection asking God to heal it. Faustina realized that small, often insignificant acts of mercy, especially when met with ingratitude, are of infinite worth in the eyes of God, since even they allow God's river of mercy to flow through human lives. I see that the smallest things done by a soul that loves God sincerely have an enormous value in His holy eyes. Jesus desired to leave a constant reminder of his divine mercy by means of this image. He appeared to Faustina in a vision on February 22, 1931, and instructed her to have the image painted according to the pattern she saw. Christ stated that if we are to receive God's mercy, then we need to trust and be merciful to others. Jesus said clearly that the title of the icon should include the word 